once a year. Now it's any time, which can make it harder because you don't have a deadline. Um, <laughs> there's the NCOA report, if you've heard me harassing you about path report, uh, wow, uh, path forms to turn in. It's so you can get this report from uh, the US Postal Service to TRG so they can run your data through bad addresses, uh, returned mail so that you're not paying to get things returned towards you. And almost every mail house will make you do it if you don't do it through TRG. Um, they have the list builder, which we'll go into in more detail, um, the basic segment builder. Um, reports, which I pulled a few of beforehand, we'll look at. Um, there's unlimited list extraction. Once you're in, you're in. The only thing you pay for is demographics. Um, and lots of online tutorials, honestly more than you're ever going to want to watch. And uh, two hours of help desk support. Uh, what's nice is they tell you how much you're using. Um, and realistically, uh, if it's something with the system, contact them. If it's just a question, feel free to contact me. Um, it's what I'm here for. Um, we met, I mentioned earlier demographics. I'll talk about these later, but um, we're using Axiom. It's what the big corporations use. They're kind of big brother, but the theory is if all the huge corporations are using them, arts and culture should be using them too. Um, so it's up, uh, updated weekly, 200 plus demographic variables. Um, I'll talk about ways you can use it later, but you can use it to mailing to people who have a certain net worth or household income. You can use it uh, for children of certain ages. If you have a summer camp, really valuable. Um, you can also look at buying habits, crossover with other companies, multi-buyer, we'll look at those later. Um, and you can look at zip codes. I suspect this is something you can do already in your data because zip code is data you have, but it is really useful to think about where are my patrons already, where should my patrons be. Um, if I'm at Dragon and I'm getting very few patrons from Redwood City, mm -hmm. it might make sense to do a huge push there mm -hmm. and let the people who are in Mountain View and San Jose keep coming, find new patrons there. Um, the streamlined trading, uh, wow, that's interesting. Um, it's uh, over a million unique households in there. Um, it's all permission-based, as I mentioned. You flag your own segments as visible or invisible to other companies. So if you have a visible segment, you still have to say, yes, they can use this. Or you can say, anyone can use this. I know for TBA, partly because I'm lazy, I've gone in and all of our visible segments are available for trading. Um, and I don't have to do anything. Our invisible segments, I'll be perfectly honest, we have segments in there that are invisible. Things like donors, things where they're going to be in our membership as well, but uh, it's not useful to have a donor list. One thing in the agreement kind of hidden in there, you can use the audience database for donors. You can't do a donor poll from another company. So yeah, I can't say, I want a list of Dragon's donors and ask them to donate to me. Because <laughs> that's not really in the spirit. Um, moving on. Mailhouse, I mentioned the NCOA hygiene, uh, and oh, and it's going to do a merge purge. I'll pull up the report to show you later how you can use this. I'm going through this rather quickly because this is the overview. A lot of this is in later, um, but this is all the information I wanted to be sure I showed at least a little bit. Um, this is one thing I think is really important with the audience database is that uh, it's really good for marketing. It can be really useful for development as well. Um, as a research tool, the number of times funders ask us, your membership, what's the age breakdown, the gender breakdown, all of this, being able to have a way I can just pull that and give it to my development staff has been incredibly useful and saved us at least a day's worth of work of trying to organize all of our stuff. Um, so. While I suspect most of you are here for marketing, make sure your development staff knows that you have access to these tools, because it's much it's not perfect, of course, but when I'm telling a funder, it's not gonna be perfect however I do it. 
Um, the other thing to mention is community crossover reporting, comparing yourself to other companies, helps you with traits, helps you know how you're doing in the field. Um, if you can see, uh, Cal Shakes has, and I'm making this up, I haven't looked at Cal Shakes, but if you can see Cal Shakes has great demographic spread on ethnicity and you're looking to do that, you A, can say, hey, can I do a trade? Try and pull some of those for me as well, and B, can say maybe it's worth talking to them, figuring out what they're doing that I can pick up on. Um, cool, moving on to the actual system. Which pulls us into reports. I want to show you first. This is Data Center. Many of you will recognize it. My reports. Uh, I have just clicked up here. This pulls all of the reports you can pull. Some of these reports <coughs> have additional options within them. A filter by specific lists you've pulled. All of that. It can sometimes take a few minutes to run reports, so I've gone ahead and pulled them already rather than sit here and wait with all of you all. Um, so, some of my personal favorite reports. I mentioned the NCO database uh, mailing mailhouse four times a year they go through. Um, this is one of the things I think a lot of their companies aren't using that's really useful because not only does it mean the data in the database already is good. You don't have to worry about your mailhouse. They also send it back to you. And they send it back to you in this form. It's just an Excel spreadsheet. The great thing about it, and this is ours, you can tell, we have a lot of addresses we should be updating. I'll be honest, we haven't yet either. Uh, but here's all of my addresses that have changed. This is the good moves report. There's also a bad move re report and the returned address report. Um, pull all three, use them to update your own databases. You should, presumably, if you have at all a robust database, hello Lisa, uh, there's a chair in the back of a chair here, whichever you prefer. Um, Can you get by? Probably not. Uh, luckily the table's open. <laughs> um, your database, it should be easy to import this put the fields in uh, to match them and get your households updated in your database. So whatever you're doing outside of the audience database costs less money too. In fact, if you're doing mailing outside of the audience database, you don't have to do, you can tell your mailhouse your data is already NCOA compatible because you've imported this. If you haven't imported this, you're gonna have to pay the mailhouse. That's gonna be like 50 bucks, 100 bucks, depending on the mailhouse. So, Big fan of this report, and as I mentioned, there are three. They do it four times a year. They, there is uh, a schedule in data center, so you can look that up. Um, this is the community organization crossover report. Um, this one's in some ways just fun. Um, this one, I look at it fairly frequently because it tells you uh, how you compare to other companies out there and it just begins to spark ideas of what you can do, which is a lot of what today is about. Um, sitting down so I can manipulate this a bit better, but uh, let's take a look. I'll take a look, pretend I'm Berkeley rep for a minute. Um, this is gonna tell me how many patrons I have. This tells me crossover. The inverse of this is gonna be unique patrons. Um, but this is saying how many companies am I like? This becomes really useful for two reasons. I can either use this by going through, let's find a relatively small number. Um, I'll just take, I did not secure those. Um, let's just take the California Jazz Conservatory. Oh, I'm in the wrong row. Still useful. Um, th there's, there's crossover, but given I have 93,000 people in here from Berkeley Rep, 760 is not that much. It means it's a really right place to start looking to pull patrons from that you may not have had access to before. Um, alternatively, if you're not doing a large one, look at Aurora. This is a big surprise. They're next door to each other. 
they have a lot of crossover. Um, the advantage of this is when you're doing a list trade, you can say, I have a lot of crossover with them. It means the people who I don't have yet would probably be interested in what I'm doing. So maybe doing a list, sending something out to Aurora's patrons uh, who aren't on my list, easy way to send a targeted mail without doing a lot of work. Um, the other thing I will say this is really valuable for, um, something we talk about a bit is the audience database, not just for mail exchanges. Um, this is really useful for figuring out who to partner with. Um, if you want to do an email exchange, do the good old, I'll mention your show in my email if you mention my show in your email. This is a great way to figure out who are good people to do that, who's a good company to start working with. Because we, I've been talking theater because it's what I know, but we also have arts and culture, you may find a surprising crossover that you didn't expect. Uh, maybe it's not surprising that there's 2,500 people who are going to the Academy of Sciences who also go to Berkeley Rep, but it's an indication that there may be a great way to start to partner with them. Um, I'm currently going to SF travel meetings, and we've been talking a lot about how great partnerships between theaters and museums and dance groups and all of this working together have started boosting everyone. So I highly encourage you to just kind of sit with this report and start to see what pops out at you. Um, there's also a percent report if you find that an easier way to look at it. Um, Question. Yeah. For this report, do the hidden like numbers of the people are actually uh, being analyzed? I believe, or is it only the people that is visible, that uh, you know, uh, this one, this available one. for trade? Up. I'm gonna take a peek. I believe you get to choose, but I need to double check. Yeah, so when you're running the report, uh, the one I pulled was tradable data only, but you get to choose all data, tradable data, or invisible data. So whichever you want. Um, and please do interrupt if you have any questions. <laughs> um, then, then why do I want to put my um, invisible data The invisible data is on there for because your usage. Because that will be allow people to analyze my data. <laughs> I don't want to do that. That's fair. Um, I, the the invisible data is most valuable. One, there is a certain advantage. Recognize at this point what you're seeing is just who's in there. Like, is there crossover? They're not able to see who these people are, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, two, putting your invisible data in there is really important once we're building lists because if I'm sending something out, there's a lot of people I want to suppress. Um, for example, I just ran a report, which I'll show you later, we're doing a mailing for our 40 at 40 celebration at the Orpheum in 10 days. Um, and uh, I don't want to send that to my donors. They already know about it. I don't want to spend the money sending it to them. It's not targeted right for them. So they're in there for us to be invisible so I can suppress them. Similarly, if I'm doing what I mentioned with Berkeley Rep, sending to Aurora, if I don't have my invisible data in there, I have so much crossover with Aurora that they're going to get it too. And let's say I put a promotion in there that's you know good for first time attendees, my patrons are going to get upset if they're seeing that first time attendees are getting 20% off and it's getting mailed to them. Um, so that's why I put my invisible data in there. Um, there may be data you don't want to put in the audience database. You do not have to put every single thing you have into the audience database. You just have to put something in um, so that there's something to work with. Did that answer your question? But she was, if you put your database in, it's only for your own mailing. You have not made that available to everybody else. Correct. If it's so, invisible, it's in, it's in yeah, house. So right? I guess, because yes. yes. your point was other people might be more interested in your information, they won't see what you're seeing. It, no, they, they will. Because when you do that uh, report, you can do a crossover, you can based do on, like a based on all the visible. You can. Not everybody you can. Know, yeah, but, the, but oh, the thing is that when they make a decision, I want to, uh, I want to mail to the, 
that's that proper for people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if they see that there's either crossover or not, I mean, if there's more crossover, right? And you don't want them to include you? I mean, you don't want them to, you know, you. I mean, is that the ultimate no. conclusion? No, I'm just wondering, you know, about the, what's the, you know, whether, what, what's actually being analyzed in this report. Yeah. Mm -hmm. at, at this point, it's just crossover numbers. So how many name address matches are there in the invisible data, not who are they, or anything like that. Um, so yes, by having invisible data in there, you're gonna see that I have crossover in the invisible data, but I don't won't know where that crossover lies. Um, so yes, it tells a little bit of information. Um, my opinion is it's not giving them access, but depending on what what you're worried about other organizations know, it could be a concern. Um, so definitely hear you, I think, with this report, not that that concerning for most organizations. In my opinion, I mean, having the invisible data in there actually allows us to really look at the data as a whole and get some um, broad strokes uh, information on them um, as, as trends as a as community. So to not have it in there actually probably could be more detrimental to you than having it in there. But, you know, it's up to everybody's <laughs> Um, So I wanted, moving on, uh, look at, this is a similar report. This tells you more about the community as a whole. Um, this report is actually um, terrifying to me. <laughs> and tells me why to use the audience database. Because over a million of the households in there have only attended one cultural or arts organization in the Bay Area. Which Out of means, a million point eight. Uh, that yeah. was a total. Okay. Yeah. Um, wow. So that means that you have a million people, minus the ones of yours that are on there, that are in the system that you can be reaching out to. Um, so it's something to be keeping in mind why trades are really useful. I'll talk about how to use those in a minute. But I did want to pull this up. You can pull this up at any time. It's the multi-buyer report. Uh, it does tell you, I mean, we do have about <laughs> 200,000 who are going to multiple organizations, more if you look at uh, three, four, five. So there are people doing lots of things. But these are low-hanging fruit, easy people to reach out to. Um, things to keep in mind. Um, another thing, just looking at the community, things to get started thinking about how you're going to do it. This is the entire community postal code reference to the audience database. Big surprise, the first seven are in San Francisco. That's not going to surprise anyone. Um, but once you start looking, we do have, and note these are mailable, so this is trade data. Um, we do have about 13,000 in Oakland, one of the zip codes, Mill Valley, et cetera, et cetera. So ways to start thinking about targeting. Easy way to look where people are. You'll note Ashland is on there. The Oregon Shakespeare Festival is one of our kind of outliers because they have such an audience database, an audience base in the Bay Area um, that they wanted to be involved. And they're a great way to get all of those people who will leave town to go see the arts but don't see the arts we have right here. <laughs> so um, really, really useful. Um, less so for Ashland, because I doubt any of you are doing major pushes into Oregon. Yeah. But they're useful for the data they do have within the system. Um, moving on, I wanted to also pull up our demographics report. I don't have time to go into the wonders of all the sorts of demographics you can do in this system. Um, but again, uh, this is, sorry, this is my list report. I wanted the community one. Uh, this just starts to show how the demographics work. Um, you'll note that for every demographic, there's going to be a percent match. That's going to tell you how many people in the database have demographic information. If you're really good at always check the don't share my information whenever you use your credit card, you're not gonna show up on this. This is people who have shared their information. So here, 
generation is a 60% match. Um, unsurprisingly, it's mostly baby boomers and then spilling off in either direction. Um, children's age is a 40% match, so not as precise, but the people who are in here, you know, are in here, um, and starts letting you know the ages of children. Interestingly enough, 10% are 17, so more towards the higher end. We can go through, just to highlight some of the demographics, we have gender, we have age, uh, we have ethnicity. Um, be careful when you're using ethnicity to look at them all, because sometimes you get uh, interesting, uh, where's one that might trip you up? Northern European, Scottish Irish, probably when you're doing things, those are both gonna pop up as white, so um, be aware what you're doing. There's also one, oh, African American professional is one that pops up. I don't know why, <laughs> but it's in there. Um, other things, I mentioned income. Income's gonna be really valuable. I'm gonna come back to income. I recommend you look at income, look at net worth, um, because you can use those. And you'll note in the database total, um, we have a good 50% of people between 65,000 and 150,000, um, which means there are people with strong incomes able to support going to the arts. We also have 6.6% 6 .6 to 150,000 plus. Um, interests, if you have something that is targeting a specific interest, um, definitely worth checking out. Um, for example, the Vida Young, Oscar de la Renta, fashion would have been a great place to reach out to people on. Um, going through other things, married, net worth, <coughs> uh, occupation, uh, can be useful, religion. You can scroll through these at your leisure, but I do want to be sure to point some of them out because they can be useful for targeting. And the last one I wanted to show you is the exact same thing, but you can do this for your own lists. So once you have a list, and you can build a list just for reporting, you don't need to use it for mailing, you can target and see who's on here. Note that if you are building a list for research, and you're wanting to do trade data, like you were saying, it still has to be permission-based. So uh, looking at uh, your data here, this is the list that we just did. Um, so those are some of the reports I wanted to point out. Before moving on, any questions on the reports? Yeah. Yeah, is there a way to uh, do a data pin to your own segments that are out there from the demographics? For example, if I want, you know, if if I'd like to have actual ages or gener you know, generations, whatever, and brought back to my own database, can I have that information get tagged onto the uh, list that I have in there that I can then uh, bring back to my own database? No, the entire demographics is all aggregate based, um, so it's not tagged to specific people in anything we have access to. Um, you can always come back to the audience database and run a new report um, to find what you want. Something that is worth saying, um, when you run a report on only your own data, you can get emails and phone numbers out of the audience database. If I'm running a list just for trades, I'm only gonna get mailing addresses. Those are only gonna go to the mailhouse. I will never see who's on that list. But if I'm running a list internally, I will get the stuff I put in. It's already in there. I'm not getting new data. But if you're, I mean, if you've got your segments there and you're running against the demographic for age, and you say, you know, give me the people in the segment are, you know, a certain generation, is it not tagging you? It is, but because the entire thing is based on aggregate data, there's no way to pull it out except by specific reports to look at specific. So it could be a really manual process, but you could actually pull several lists out, mark them as such, and then put them back into your own system, right? Yes. I would not, honestly, what I re recommend is for any demographic work you're wanting to do, just using data center, um, depending on what you want. Um, you can update as many segments into there as you want to, and because you can do it at any time, 
um, that sort of crossover that you can do within your own database should be mostly doable within the audience database where you're going to start to run into uh, difficulty is if you're doing the sorts of research on like what nights are people uh, attending or as opposed to who attended this show it gets more complicated if you're looking who attended my Sunday matinees or something like that um, that would involve a lot of list uploads um, and I can see where what you're talking about could be a lot more valuable unfortunately is outside of the scope yeah. moving on to uh, list building um, and I think I haven't talked a lot about what I handed out to you. First page is just an overview. Most of this I've either talked about, you've read elsewhere, or you already know. Second page is a list of everyone in there right now. Um, this is useful because I bet there are some surprises on this list. Um, I'm rather impressed with the scope of the people interested. So worth taking a look at. I wanted to give that to you. Um, Third page talks about our current usage fees, which I'll talk about at the end. Mentions there's an upcoming TRG webinar. If you don't feel comfortable with uploading data yet, I encourage you to attend this. I find the webinars a lot easier to sit through than the videos. Um, if you're a visual learner, I recommend it. If just looking at a report works for you, there's also, and I emailed it out, a link to uh, the training center for all of up the training center for you for a second. Um, and of course, <coughs> you're all here, so I'm not seeing it. I'll put it sideways. There it is. Um, for everything in training center, um, how to build lists, for example, they have training documents as well. I'm a big fan of just skimming the training document for what you need. Um, if you feel comfortable and you just have one question, usually you can just find it with a control F search in the training document. Um, if you need an overview, aren't feeling completely comfortable yet, watch the videos, read the whole document, depending on how you learn. Um, but I wanted to point out the webinar to you because um, I am skipping adding segments. I wanted to show you a couple of lists. Uh, I have two here that I pre prepped This is the one where we actually mailed this <laughs> earlier this week, I mentioned earlier. Um, we duplicate it on track. Um, <coughs> great. I wanted to show this one because it's an example of how you can start using filtering intelligently. A number of you probably approved this trade. Thank you. Um, this one, uh, I went through every company that had subscriptions or if you had one big event and put them in a giant list. There's, I think, 50 different trade segments in here. Um, but then did a multiplier and said, I want people who have been to at least three of these. So what I did was I found people who had been to three of your companies. This was all for theater specifically because we're doing a celebration of theater. Um, people who have been to three of these, that's going to imply they care enough about theater. They're going to be interested in seeing our historical timeline, backstage tour, the Orpheum, the things we're doing. So I was specifically looking for people who are going to multiple venues um, and going a lot. And I got a list of uh, 111, which was the amount of number of postcards I had, I kept changing the multi-buyer number until I found my sweet spot, um, which I recommend. These sorts of filters are really useful for using excess <coughs> postcards you have, getting rid of that stock, um, or limiting how much you're ordering in the first place, um, which is going to come up when I talk about the other list. Let me go back and take this one. Uh, this one was one I ran in preparation, knowing what I was talking about um, today. These are just our members. Um, from we, we were bad and didn't upload our members in 2014, so I have 2015 and 2013 in here. Um, and I did a report here 
on Postal Code, seeing who was local, and also, oh, I didn't do it, but I will do it right now, going through list demographics, I wanted to look up net worth. Um, you'll note, on demographics, this is the one additional cost you're going to see in the audience database. Most of you probably know this. Uh, cost per 1,000 people on the list. Uh, in this case, it's 1225 Note, if you are doing a demographics for mailing, there's going to be a cost attached to it. Um, the cost is going to be a minimum of $25. So if you're doing a very targeted mailing, something like this is not worth worrying about, that it's a high value item. Uh, net worth is, of course, high value because I can choose some of my higher net worths, um, do a demographic filter, get some net counts, let me see. I have 14 people on that list. Note, this is all internal data. I'm not doing any trades on this. So I can start to use this for reaching out to potential donors who are already interacting with us. Um, and in that case, yes, I'm gonna have a list cost of $25 to send it out, but sending a letter to 14 people targeted to, I know you have money, choose to spend it on us, is well <laughs> worth it compared to sending 3,000 letters to all of our members hoping that we might be able to get $5 from each. Um, save effort, save, save energy, save time. Um, I love this report, I want every company, and you can do this with income, you can do this with net worth. Either way, I highly encourage you all to do this. Um, it is my favorite trick, and I don't know of any company that has actually done it. Um, so finding a way to get those high values, because let's be honest, most of us are running largely off of donation. Um, so really valuable, wanted to be sure to show you that one. Um, yeah. Can you go back to that one that you have to be segmented? Yeah, I can. And you tell me how you did it. I um, I have a way to do it, but uh, you know, I find it like you know, it's really manual and kind of comes to me. Maybe you have good tricks of this. I can learn. <laughs> I suspect mine was very manual too. This list probably took me a good twenty minutes to make. I went through, added my trade segments, and selected. And I'll be honest, I was looking at some of our larger organizations uh, in theaters. I tried to choose some of the more interesting smaller <laughs> ones to say, you know, let's get some new blood in there. But I definitely want to hit ACT, Berkeley Rep. I think that Cal Shakes was on there. Aurora was on there. Um, thank you both. Um, uh, but I went through, I'll put in ACT did a segment search, and then I was looking for subscriptions personally, so it looks like ACT doesn't have their subscriptions available for trade until 2012, um, going back. I don't remember which I chose, but I think I did full subscription, partial subscription, added selected, went back in, did it again for each company. Um, I suspect that's how you were doing it. Uh, I have, okay, I can show my different way to it. Yeah, please. Um, but I, you can just, um, so you can just add a segment, right? But I do the basic list. Okay, from here, that you have to put it in whatever organization you want to, mm -hmm. right? You can do it just whatever, yeah, okay. Um, then you actually, from the segment, um, from the segment, you actually, from there, you actually can filter. So it's a little easier, a little faster, you can type in whatever you want. Because I find that the group selection is actually manual. You have to go through, if a organization has like 50 segments, you have to manually yeah. look. And then this one actually you can filter. Yeah, so going to a larger organization, you're talking about doing a filter here, yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so you, it's easier for, for to find just at least narrow really quickly to whatever we want. Let's do a segment type filter subscription, search segments, that would be an easier way to find it. Definitely. This was a pain point, so. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe there's a, a, a better way, yeah. I yeah. think that's the best one, unless anyone else knows of some other way in. Hi. There's a chair right in the back if you want to sit down. Where? Right in the middle. Right there. <laughs> Thank you. I don't have a better way, but just to kind of uh, piggyback on this. 
I recently did a postcard mailing and wanted to hit a couple of organizations that I knew had done a, um, play by a similar playwright or the same playwright. I had no idea when that play <laughs> happened. So, you know, I pulled up, I think one of them was ACT, and so I pulled up ACT and there's like that huge list, and then in the segment description, I could type in the name of the play that I was looking for. Mm -hmm. And that I think got me to it really quickly. So it seems basic list is a little easier. However, it's kind of bizarre when you send this out. People don't see what you, what you're asking for um, because you only say you know whatever I could find what that is and then luckily nobody asked me what I ask <laughs> but whenever people use this function asking us we always ask what are you looking for what I what do you want uh, so I guess. It, when the trade request comes out, mm -hmm. the note is If you do a basic, a basic list, not as a, not the uh, trade. Uh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it's like one list with all of the organizations in one list. Yeah, and so it's sort of hard for you to you nope. you have to do a lot of work to see what specific segments they're asking. I don't know what they're asking. I actually have to write back say, what are you asking? Because, so well, some of sometimes we we cannot read it through every segment because. You know, we are mailing to that specific segment at the same time. Which is why I love the permission based functions of the audience. Yeah. Database. So, <laughs> so that's the, the, so that's the, the, I guess it's not the perfect part of this uh, basic, like this way to, to, to pour. It's convenient for you, but uh, you might end up getting a lot of questions to ask you. Yeah. So when I'm asking. Yeah. And, that is why there is a report with contact info, and when you have a trade, you can send back. Um, to clarify, you can see the purpose of the mailing that they're asking for, yeah, but I you can can't see, see what segment they're asking. Yeah. If you do build it based on like a say basic yeah. list, that makes that makes sense, and is one of the limitations. Um, I wanted to pass this around as we go through on a couple of more things. I got this in the mail this week. I have to say, because I run this program, I always get really, really excited when I get mail from a company when I know I'm not on their list. Mm -hmm. I know the opera doesn't have me on their list. Um, nicely done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this uh, because it's a simple subscription mailer, um, but uh, what they did is said you're invited free season subscription to one person who fills out their contact info and sends it back to the opera. This is so obviously an audience database mailing, <laughs> it hurts, um, because this is telling me they don't have my contact info, they're willing to give me the chance to get something to get my contact info. My contact info is certainly worth a chance at a free season subscription to the opera, right? So I'll send this in and they'll have my information. So I just wanted to pass this around as a way you can start to Beyond being intelligent by what lists oh, do you're you want me to tell you what, how we did that? <laughs> <laughs> I assume I, I can, I'm happy. To yeah, tell please. You what we did? Okay, so um, the that's what we call prospect card, and uh, so um, we mail to two hundred thirty thousand um, people from actually this database as well as our own uh, old names who haven't come forever. Like they, they were in the database, we have lots of names, and, uh, but they haven't been active for a very long time. So we put the, uh, I don't even remember, like probably 150,000 names in there. And then we got 100,000 names from this database. And we also, outside of the database, we actually got, uh, four, uh, I don't remember, 100,000 names from the trades, like the people who actually Actually, a lot of people on this here, we did not ask them from the database. It's because uh, their names are too old. And okay, we are also guilty of that. We, our names are not that great, but uh, so, so for example, like, uh, um, you know, some organization, we just go to them directly. And some people, we go to them directly because we want the newer names. And uh, um, see like Oregon Shakes, they just say, okay, we're gonna, um, load the data in here. And then so we end up pulling the name from there. And so then we put all those names into the merge. Uh, in the past, sometimes we read names, but 
you know, those meetings are usually not really as great as the people who are in the database or the training. But they are not really the artist names. We think they are prospects, that's it. So you just, you know, did a huge data, like a merge purge, and then you end up with um, whatever the mailable names you want. And uh, we put our names in there for one, um, we don't really mail to like say 150,000 names that we actually put into, but we end up selecting the people who are actually, there were 20,000 people who were actually not active in our list, but they are actually active in the database of, the of our choice of those people we think, you know, we use that crossover report to see who are most likely people. So there will be those 20,000 people who are actually still active in the arts community to the similar organization we think they are interested in, and then we find those people are actually helpful and for us, and we just send it to the people, and, and we send it back, and we just put them into the database or market to them. And then so those people are reactive. We are trying to reactive those, that the people who were in our old database, and now we know who they are, we mark them. I totally get the strategy, but as an arts organization that got the request from Opera. The difficulty is, is that, especially right now, you're getting. I'm getting ready to pay yet again to be part of TRG Arts, the shared database, and yet this I'm doing on the side mm -hmm. for free. And more and more of the partners that I might want, if they're not on this list, or if they're only giving me 2012 and 2014 information. It makes the database less valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I would much rather lend my names through an anonymous direct mail house to the Opera, mm -hmm. so that when I want Opera's updated list, I can contact them directly. We and say, we do a lot of direct trade now as well. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's a problem. It is. Mm -hmm. Um, and those of you who read my emails carefully, um, will know this is something that came up when we switched over to Data Center because it switched into the upload at any time. Mm -hmm. um, y people didn't have that fire, oh gosh, I have to get my data in right now. So I know how busy we all are. It means that we haven't gotten uploads regularly. ACT is not as bad as this looks because this is subscription data. They do have single ticket data more recently. Um, but there is a new rule this year because I got a number of comments on this. I tried to implement in the middle of the year, couldn't do it. Um, you have to have, to renew this year, at least one visible for trade segment that is from the past year. So <coughs> there has to be something you have uploaded in the past year if you are renewing, and there has to be something that is available for trade. You don't have to give permission to everyone who wants it, right. but there has yeah. to be at least one thing. And we will be going through when you say, yes, I'm ready to upload again, and checking. I mean, I will literally come in here and say, ACT, uh, do a search, uh, once I can get rid of subscriptions, <laughs> um, do a search, okay, they have 2014, they need to upload something before the tip is um, So I know this is a problem, I recognize it, it will not be a pro problem after July, because everyone will have to have something in there from the past year. Um, now there may be specific trades in there that you're looking for something that uh, has. What, when is the uh, next membership due? July 1st. Do do? <laughs> <laughs> July 1st, and uh, it's not in here, uh, but uh, I mentioned it in the email, I'll talk about it some more. Uh, for renewals, we are changing the term. If you look at the usage fees, you'll note the base usage fee is higher than last year. The monthly usage fee is not higher. We are extending the next year. Instead of July to June, it will be July to September. Um, and then the next year of usage will start October 1st through September 30th. We're doing this A to get more in sync with TRG's calendar. So your usage fee schedule matches theirs and we don't have any weird disconnects. Also, we recognize a lot of people are ending their year on June 30th, so asking people to pay before June 30th is causing trouble for a number of companies, so <coughs> putting it into a few months into next year 
is allowing companies to get in. Also, we end our year on June 30th, and I have a lot more time in September to talk to everyone and help if anyone has any questions. Um, I have a couple more minutes here. I wanted to check in if anyone else had any great, we talked about the <laughs> opera mailing, which I loved because it shows not only how you can pull a good list, but what you can do with it with creative strategies uh, to help you in the long run. Talking about uh, pulling lists for fundraising and donor outreach. Does anyone else have anything they've done that really worked? Because um, as I said, you're in the ground a lot more. If you think of something, please let me know, because this is a communal database for a reason um, that I wanted to, I want to be sure we share amongst each other as much we can. I'm going to leave the rest of the PowerPoint out, um, because you have most of it in front of you. Um, I will refer, however, I talked about the upcoming TRG webinar, I think you've all looked at it. Um, if you are calculating, uh, we have a return on investment calculator um, that you can pull up um, that talks about the literal cost value of the database, how much you're saving if you use it. I will say again, the database is as valuable as you're able to make it, so you have to be in there to use it if you don't have time to be in there. We're a service organization. I don't want you paying us for something you can't use, um, but at the same time, Hopefully this helps you figure out new and better ways to do it. Um, for those who aren't in there, so I'm gonna look right at you, Alex. <laughs> uh, there's a calendar on the back of that of the schedule for joining. Note that the pricing is for a year. So if you're able to join and interested on July 1st, I highly recommend it because it's gonna be the same price, but there is a whole process to get in, which this goes over in more detail. I also included our useful handout, so you're producing a show, TBA can help. Um, if you're a theater company and we haven't talked about this, or you don't feel like you know every single thing on here, please feel free to set up a time to talk with me, um, because we recognize we do a lot of random things, like the audience database that you wouldn't necessarily expect, um, and we wanna be sure that you know about them. Um, this is an overview, I'm happy to go over them in more detail. If you're not a performing arts company, some of these are still very useful. I know many of you already use things like Postcard Distribution Network and things like that. But um, please feel free to reach out. While we are a theater service organization, anything we can do, we see it as a large arts community. We're trying to help everyone. Rising tide, all ships, that sort of thing. I have a question. Um, every time we ever do a mailing, we'll get a percentage of people that say, please don't send me any more of your materials. I'm worried about the environment. I'm happy just to get emails. Mm -hmm. So I put them on our do not mail list. Perfect. Don't roll it into this. So that when, if I were to say, can I have your list, they're going to be getting that list with those names still on it. Just because I'm busy and I, it's not something I'm, whenever I do my mailing, I send our do not mail list together with whatever list I'm renting or borrowing or trading. I guess my question is, is there any way that it could be, that, that um, is there any system-wide, these people don't want to be mailed anything. It has nothing to do with my organization. It's just that they don't want paper in their mailbox. So there's two things. Um, one, when you get someone asking, do not mail or do not trade, please do roll them in, and you can do this once a quarter or however much you need to, but please roll them into, in the system you have your the own, right. do not mail, do not trade. Those will be excluded from any trades okay. you're doing with the opera, et cetera. Um, and uh, also there is, I'm happy to say, and I haven't looked into the details of it because I was setting this up, but a week ago, TRG has finalized our request um, that I can go in and put in a patron as never do no. any interaction with the audience database. We will only do that if they specifically say, don't do things with the audience database. Because they could say, for example, I don't want to get any paper mail, but mean they don't want solicitation, but they do really want uh, 
Aurora's season schedule that they get every year that you might happen to send using the audience database, and if we put them in an exclude, they're not going to show up. Right. So it needs to be someone saying, hi, how did you get my name? I've heard there's this audience database thing. Please make sure that I'm never in there, and then we can do something about it. Um, in general, I'm going to tell you right now, Tell usually it comes to box office staff. I've worked with Derek at CalShakes for a while, so I've been on both ends of this. Um, if you say, I did it through the system of the audience database, it leads you to this long conversation about what the audience database is. They get freaked out. You have to explain how it's permission-based, it's aggregate, yeah. you have no idea who they are. Uh, point out that you don't have their information. It's easiest to say, we did this through a trade with one of our partners. Um, we can add you to our, we never actually saw the list, so we need your name to add you to our do not trade list, but we are happy to do so. Um, if you do it that way, it saves them a lot of time, a lot of confusion. I highly recommend doing that, um, because while this is perfectly above board and all of that, really what it's doing is facilitating those sorts of trades. Once people actually start hearing about it, it takes about 10 minutes to try and explain why it isn't just a massive list with their information that everyone has access to. Um, I saw Marilyn's hand first, and I will say, I was going to stick around anyway. It is a little after 11.30, so if anyone has to walk out the door, please feel free. But everyone else, I'll take the questions that we do have, um, and then I'll stay <coughs> too. But. So just, just to clarify, because uh, we just did a mailing and used it exclusively OSF's uh, database uh, for the targeting. Really smart and, for CalShakes. <laughs> and got, and uh, got a notice back from a patron saying exactly what you just said. How did you get my information? I don't want to receive information from you. Blah, blah, blah. They aren't in our database at all. And so what I'm understanding you saying is that we should add them to our database and mark them do not mail. Yes. Okay. And that is a difficult conversation to have, because I've had that conversation when I was working at CalShakes. And sometimes they'll go, I don't want to be there, ignore it, don't do anything. Um, but most of the time, you can, if you can successfully say, we got it from someone else, but we never saw it, so to make sure we never get it again, we need it. <laughs> so they'll go for it. <laughs> I know, it's backwards. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, as a follow-up to that, uh, though, it, sometimes people are in different databases in different ways, and so how do they, what's the key to having them in excludes? The audience database is all based on street addresses. Uh, street addresses and I believe uh, first last name matches. Okay, so if you have a street address and a number sign, apartment, you know, of course, it all gets NCLA, and so it all gets standard. Yep. But okay. It so, but my other uh, uh, thing question was, if I have somebody, if I have a segment up there that's got everybody who got a certain thing, and then I have some of those names are on the do not mail, is that the proper way to, or should yes. they? They should be in the segment and on the do not mail. They should, if they're on the do not mail, it. Almost doesn't matter if they're in the segment, um, because you're not going to be mailing to them unless you're doing research off of them, which is why I would encourage you to put them in the mailing segment, and then do not mail and do not trade will automatically be in your exclude files. Will be, I mean, it will exclude them from someone else's yeah. choosing that segment. That is the that is the purpose of do not trade specifically. It always gets called in. Yes. Okay. Are there other, so there's do not mail and do not trade always come into play mm -hmm. when someone requests a list from you. Are there other um, list types that do that as well? You can the set list? them over in your uh, segment builder. Right. Uh, you can when make an exclude right. list type, but those are the ones that are kind of like, TRG <laughs> says you're going to want to have these. Right, right. So it's just, the, it's just those two. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for everyone? Uh, in that case, I will let you all take off. I think you all have my contact info, so I didn't voice my card on to you all. But if anyone does not have my contact info, 
I have my card right here. Please feel free to stick around, ask any questions you have about the audience database specifically, but if you have any others, I'm around, don't have any plans for the next hour or so, so I have plenty of time. Is there any plan to put emails into the system? We can't put emails into the system because of spam mail laws. And we've thought about